Hey, all right. Uh, Brian Parker here again. Uh, I'm trying to condense this to not an hour like I usually do, but uh, my tagline right now is 30 years in about 30 minutes. I'm told I should go shorter, but uh, I go on and on, according to a lot of judges. Anyway, uh, today's topic will be about success. Success as an attorney. It really, um, the basis of your success will be, as I've preached before, the love of what you do. You don't marry someone you like, you marry someone you love, and you are at your most creative. Creativity breeds opportunity. I'm not sure which one comes first, whether it's opportunity or creativity, or creativity, now there's opportunity, but in my case, um, when I came out of law school. And again, this video is something I want to, it's a topic in my life that I want to tell you that could be in your life. Success, again, is predicated on having the opportunity. I don't think you're going to be as successful as you want to be working for somebody else. You may want to work with somebody else as a lawyer and then get enough experience to then go out. But uh, by my way of thinking, and it's my way of thinking, doesn't have to be your way of thinking, that's three to five years you wasted your time. Sure, you paid some bills and you got some experience. You're gonna get the same experience, probably more, have more responsibility, and be in charge of your real life. It just takes a recognition that life is short. <laughs> uh, it's what you put into it, and you can kind of park yourself, park your butt in a seat for three to five years. So you're actually putting off the, the decision to how am I going to be a success in this law business? Find your niche. There's tons of them in the law business, um, the law business. What happened to me is I had come out of law school. Nobody wanted me. Heck, I barely could stand myself. Um, and I passed the bar in Florida, and then I passed the bar in Michigan, and I now needed a job, and no one was hiring me. I, I think I worked for my brother-in-law for about a month or so, but I knew what I didn't want, and I just don't get along in the sandbox with people, as they say in the corporate world. I just don't, uh, and that's okay. I like me, so <laughs> most of the time. And what I like about myself is, is the fear quotient. If you are scared, you get cre creative and you need opportunity. I was living uh, with my wife and, and a baby and I had nothing. I had a degree and I passed the bar and I happened to go to a state bar meeting, uh, a local state bar meeting and met with somebody that was aware of me and I was fortunate enough at that time that I had a little bit of business uh, that she could see she could turn to much better uh, opportunity than dumb me who's got five minutes as experience as an attorney and in turn she told me she would show me what she did and at the time she was the only person doing this little statute called the lemon law and the lemon law is you got a bad car, it's not repaired four times, you can get your client's money back and uh, get your attorney fees paid. And it was in Detroit, Michigan, which is weird because that's the car capital of the world at the time. And why would they have such a good statute? But we had democratic um, or non-business-like and large union lobbies and representation in Lansing, the capital. So there were a lot of these good anti-car statutes there, including the Garage Keepers Liability Act and the Michigan's Finance Act, all good stuff that a Republican uh, government would not allow. So, uh, so we had this great statute and I took her practice and developed it on steroids. I just worked my butt off and I had opportunities within this lemon law world and uh, did quite well with it and then left her and created my own thing. And um, so I'm doing this lemon law. At the time, consumer law was looked upon as a place where it's a joke. No, no one wants to do that. Everybody wants to do personal injury. You can make 
gobs of money doing very little work as a personal injury back then. I think, let's say the 90s. I took this lemon law thing, got magnetic lemons and gave mag le magnetic lemons to my clients to put on their cars, put on my car. I'd have this funny thing where I'd, I'd sneak out in the morning and put a magnetic lemon with my phone number on the back of my wife's van or her friend's van. And I'd get these calls from different places and I'd know where my friend's wife was or my wife was from people seeing this big giant lemon on the back of their van and my wife and her friend didn't know that. But what they also didn't know is that they were making me money because there was such a shortage of lemon lawyers, if you will, and, uh, so, and so many lemons at the time. So uh, I became the lemon law guy and I, one time I went into court and again, my point is the derision and the uh, negativity that came to consumer lawyers. In fact, I spent a couple of years educating judges as to what this statute was, also the Consumer Protection Act. It was quite a tough ride, but I, I stuck it out. It's hard work. Um, and I tell my kids, and I tell them today, the harder you work, the luckier you get, which is creativity and which is uh, opportunity. Remember that. And I remember walking in judge on a busy Friday morning in motion call day in Wayne County. Just picture, Wayne County, just picture uh, a large zoo where somebody left the gates open. You got people, you got noise, you got everybody yelling at each other and judges not showing up. It's just a, a nightmare every Friday. You're driving down there going, ugh. So I walk into court and the judge was on the bench, which is a surprise. Down there, the judges weren't on time. And the place was packed. The judge said, everybody stop. And I said, what the heck? And she said, the lemon law king just walked in, making fun of me, making fun of my practice. And everybody had a good laugh. I didn't. I said, lemon law king? That's fantastic. That's opportunity. That's creativity taking something negative. It's a double-edged sword. I became the Lemon Law King. So <laughs> I expanded this Lemon Law to great heights. Um, but everything has a shelf life. Remember that, especially in this business. When I come up with an idea, I automatically have a clock going in my head that says, uh, you got 18 months. And it's, it's no different than any marketing concept. You, you start hard, you get it, get it going, get it going, and all of a sudden it's making money for you at the top of, I think it's called a bell curve, where you, it becomes a cash cow. You don't have to do anything. It's making its money because all your hard work is now paying off, all your marketing. And then it just eventually drops. That's, I looked at that as an 18, so when I came up with an idea, I was already, already depressed and looking for the next idea because I knew I had 18 months. So if it went longer than 18 months and I made more money, fine. But your, your idea, is just waiting for the next one to take over the idea. So I maximized this thing. And one day, a client who I got out of a Ford Thunderbird, and at the time, all the brakes, especially with Fords, I, I'm not sure who else was, they're having the asbestos take out. You see asbestos litigation on TV. Well, at, the, at this time is when Congress was eliminating asbestos, when it was really serious. And so they took the asbestos out of brakes and whatever they did to replace the asbestos didn't work. So cars, big trucks were just going right through red lights. And I got so many people out of their trucks and their cars. We would do hand over fist the money. I remember looking out my office window and there were uh, trucks, uh, FedEx, DHL, Airborne Express, all these trucks pulling up to give me checks. It was just a line of checks every day. Like, oh, here comes some more checks. Things were going great. I had a client that had a Ford Thunderbird with the brakes just died. And I got him out of the vehicle and he looked at me one day as I'm giving him a check. I'm giving him a check. And he's got a free car from a couple of months and I give him a check. And he says, man, I wish you could help my boss. He's got a lemon. And I go, sure, I'll help him. What kind of car is it? He goes, it's not a lemon. It's a, uh, 
It's a computer that keeps breaking down. They just opened the store. It's a beautiful, at the time, we were just starting to have um, the super grocery stores. Today's Whole Foods and all the different iterations of these fantastic type grocery stores where you get exquisite things. That wasn't a thing back in the 90s. It was just happening. And this one grocery store had started a this great sort of Whole Foods type grocery store in 1997 and they couldn't get it going. They had banks of these cash registers and tons of organics and food and especially things from other countries. But the people would fill up their carts, come to the cash register, use their credit card, and the machines would all break down. And just driving these poor people crazy. They're operating at, with cash. A new starting business, it doesn't have much of a shelf life either if you don't have enough cash and they weren't bringing in the cash because they were losing their credit cards. And so this guy said, could you come and please just talk to my boss? And I kind of put that case off. Every weekend I'd be going out there and instead of taking the exit off uh, 696, I'd keep going and went somewhere else. I just wasn't into it. And then one day I said, ah, what the heck? I went and I visited and I discovered they had 10 groceries, they had 10 cash registers. And when, <clears throat> by the way, I should have titled this for you. Uh, this is kind of weird how I do this. The editing's not going to help. But this <laughs> case is called The Case That Saved the World. Now, I use that line, or at least I used to, when I picked up uh, women. Hey, I represented a client that saved the world. I stopped the end of the world. You're looking at the guy that saved the world. And uh, that doesn't help until I explain to them exactly why I did. And suddenly, uh, I'm not lonely. So this case, I walk in, and what's happening is every time someone comes in with a card, a credit card, that has zero, zero on it, if it's 97, it'll say 97, it would crash the cash registers. I, 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 if you're not familiar at the time, there's this uh, acronym or three uh, letters, Y and a number, Y2K. But nobody knew any of that. They just knew that when the credit card came in and its expiration date was zero, zero, it would not only kill the one cash register, it would kill all the banks of cash register. Now they'd have to have a computer guy to come in and restart or reboot or whatever. No one could figure it out. I had a computer guy at the time. I said, hey, man, you got to come in and tell me what's going on. He goes, oh, that's Y2K. The computers are all going to crash in 2000 because when computers were created, and again, I can't explain this now, but the computer was only looking at the last two numbers. The people that, in, that coded for computer hardware and software didn't contemplate that 01 or 2020 or 2019 would be part of the lexicon 40 years before they were just inventing computers. But the computer thought it was the year 1900 when the card was slid, slid through and it would just say, this isn't a 1900, boom, it would close. And I took a Lemon Law complaint. That guy's Thunderbird. Breach of warranty, Lemon Law, Magnus and Moss Warranty Act, breach of implied warranty, and just changed some things. And instead of Lemon Car, it became Lemon Computer. And just filed this case. Figured the manufacturer would call me, mea culpa, sorry, we'll fix it. Because I didn't have... I didn't have a clue of what I was doing. And what I was doing was filing the world's first Y2K lawsuit. I didn't know that. I was just trying to help these poor folks. I recognize starting a business is tough and they'd invested a lot of money. And I filed this case, served it on to Shiva, I believe. And that was it. And I'm at home one day and um, I got my kid and the phone is ringing off the hooks and we're trying to have family time and my wife reluctantly answers the phone 
uh, prior to that, I told her about my day and these weird things are going on. And she used to call me Walter Mitty. You'd have to check that out. But Walter Mitty was in his head all the time, believing he was more superior than he, he was, putting himself in these great situations when he was just an average guy. Well, that's, I guess, was her term for me. And I think she got that from my mother. <laughs> and so I think she just finished calling me Walter Mitty on something. And the phone is ringing. And we're having family time. And... It's 60 minutes. And she looked at me and she said, what have you done? I said, I don't know what's going on. And then I think Peter Jennings or just a bunch of famous people were starting to call the house, calling me at work and say, well, we and they want to know, how did I know what I was doing? And this is pure genius. Uh, you know, in my head, it was the emperor's not wearing any clothes, but opportunity creativity right here's an opportunity uh, it wasn't like I was thinking money I was thinking hey let's see where this goes this is I get bored easily I have to do new and exciting things so I said this is an opportunity and I'd like to meet some of these new celebrities and off we go apparently there's the Y2K is coming this bug that's going to destroy the world because planes are going to be falling out of the sky this is all true you can look it up well whether it was going to happen or not that was up to me. It was my job to save the world. And I filed that case and it got traction, man. It got traction. That took off. I'm suddenly a wanted man in that every news organization thinks I'm the expert on Y2K. And no news is going to make any money or get listeners or viewers unless they're being sensationalist. So they sensationalized this Y2K, and it was actually a good thing. In fact, they'd sit me down in their newsroom, or they'd come to my office, and they'd say, we want you to say the worst. And uh, I'd say, well, here's what's going to happen. they go, great stuff. I didn't realize what I was saying. I had educated myself to figure out what was going on. And I got educated from the very people, trade magazines, computer magazines, everything, everybody. It, frankly, was a practice killer. Because I was doing nothing else all day but taking news organizations' requests to say how the world is coming to an end. The world is coming to an end. And so here I was. Um, at one point, I still wasn't really quite in tune with what was going on. And some organization said, would you come out to San Francisco and come to some organization? And I'm like, blah, 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 free trip to San Francisco. I'll do it. So I go out to San Francisco and they are talking the it's the there's a there's a dais and there's a panel and then they move the panel and they're all talking about this one case and this one guy this freaking guy is a genius and I look around and there's some heavy hitters and mostly personal injury attorneys and tobacco lawsuit attorneys and and senators and a couple of really big wig what I'm, I'm I swear to you I had a, a $200 suit and um, maybe a $20 tie and a cheap stained shirt I wasn't expecting anything I was just expecting to get in get a free uh, trip to San Francisco I want to go to Chinatown so they're talking about this dude that's really cool and he's done this and he's a genius and he filed this and he filed a breach of warranty how did he know this and jeez I'm like, this guy sounds pretty cool. And they're talking about this guy. I'm thinking, wow, another celebrity. So I'm looking behind me for the guy. I'm looking around, me, or gal, and I'm looking around for this person. And like, this guy's solid, man. They love this guy. The whole freaking conference is about this guy and this silly case. And then someone says, without further ado, come up to the podium, Brian Parker. And I'm like, what? They hadn't even told me. Uh, maybe I got that late or something. I didn't care. I was to speak on the, this big case. Every huge law firm was there because they recognized that the liability from all the machines dying of airplanes falling out of the sky, ATMs, banks, everybody losing their ass and losing money and death and destruction, that's what attorneys love, um, 
this was bigger than at the time the tobacco sell settlement which was billions that was running down and now they saw this Y2 case triple quadruple the amount of money so everybody's watching me and doing anything I said and taking that little case that was just the lemon law case and getting really excited and now I got to get up there and give a speech and be the person that they just announced I was, which I'm not. And I winged it. Yeah, as an attorney, you're probably pretty good at winging it, because uh, they say, or they used to say, shooting from the hip. In this case, it got me to San Francisco. It also got me in front of the U.S. Senate Commerce Committee with John McCain and at the time a guy from South Carolina, Fritz Hollings, who in front of me started getting in each other's grill, complaining, McCain's complaining about what an idiot I am about, and um, about uh, lawyers in general. You gotta think where he's coming from. He's a poor guy who's stuck in a cage for five and a half years, and then these lawyers come along complaining about back injuries that don't exist and yada yada he's a tough guy so he probably hated lawyers and so him and Fritz Hollings in the middle of the Senate are arguing and Hollings is like no Mr. Parker is doing a great job he's bringing justice and all these terms and I'm just thinking how, what the heck how is this thing going and it's killing my practice it's so big and at the time we're still moving along with this case and it's the more it gray hair it gets the longer it goes the more this thing is sucking the life out of my practice and I got sick of it and then Michigan says come to Lansing we want you to announce how we're gonna so McCain he he saw this tobacco settlement and he created the Y2K liability immunity protection act or something like that and that allowed really bullshit uh, standard of care to say hey I did this send a letter to the customer or the person has their money in our bank hey we did what we're supposed to do it's on you it, it was really weak what he was doing and I was there in in uh, Washington to talk against it but I don't know, remember what happened that day my client came along with me it was just quite interesting I walked the halls of the Senate going what the hell it's what it's that once in a lifetime case and I thought, I gotta stop this. <laughs> so the case kept getting litigated. Now I'm in depositions with these huge companies looking down at me, what an idiot I am, because I am, and I'm representing this world saving, beating, one of a kind case. They're looking for the real firm behind this, and there isn't, there's just me and my client. and. Bless my client's heart. They didn't go anywhere else. They're like, Parker's the man. He got that guy out of a Thunderbird, so he must be good. And we're suing this huge corporation. Uh, so this freaking thing, this case continued on and on. <laughs> it finally, finally, it mediated, mediated out. It went before a mediation panel. They put a number on it. It got worked out. Um, but the case and my yelling and screaming and media recognizing a golden goose like they always do taking off and just there's money to be made on many levels of the silly case what happened though is companies got scared they started and if you want to see a cool movie uh, it's one of my favorite movies it's called office space and office space sorry I keep looking down if you look at the camera but I'm reading my notes laughing at myself um, office space was about <laughs> this coder and their job was to fix all the code in a certain area before the Y2K. If you, you can see it and it'll make sense. And everybody did this. And there was these large firms that were getting the contracts 
to fix banks, fix governments. Everybody's racing to 2000. We all thought that the thing was going to come to an end. I remember sitting in at my desk with my AOL waiting for the world to end as I watched it first hit Guam. And by then, it's just a bug that's going from country to country. And nothing happened. But no planes fell out the sky. But that silly little case, that opportunity and my creativity saved the world because companies got freaking scared. They got, they saw what was happening with the tobacco liability settlement and money was to be made. The other side of that is every time I'd come out and yell about the end of the world and fill your bathtubs with water, I had a, I had a Y2K room. It had guns, it had food, it had MREs. I was in the army so I knew about MREs. I just stocked it in my basement. I was ready. Um, everybody did that. Well, companies got really scared and they fixed the problem. I think I had a hand in that. So I can legitimately say I saved the world. It was a cool trip, man. You can find cases like that. They're out there. They're exciting. They're a pain in the ass. They're practice killers. But they'll put you on the map. And you can use them to pick up dates if you want. Um, but my real point is opportunity, creativity. Imagine how creative with the opportunity I had to be to keep this thing going, to be the expert. I'm not an expert in anything. I am now, but I, at the time I was just a punk. I, I, I've, I've got a video, my first video, it's a trailer where I say, I witnessed some poor lady get hit by a car twice and I had learned the Good Samaritan rule and my friend that was with me raced out to help her and I walked away because I was thinking like a lawyer. Oh my God, if I go out there, I'll cause injury and then I'll be hurt and my friend who was a human being. So I, I said in the video, while Glenn did the right thing by running out to help her, I was a shithead and I walked the other way because I was thinking like a lawyer and yet within eight years I was named the lawyer of the year and that's why that case me along with I think nine other people were named lawyer of the year uh, and um, that's what a good case will do that's what opportunity that's what, cre what creativity will do They're, bring those to bear in your practice bring those skills that you all have mix in a little bit of fear and no money and two hundred dollar suits to mishmash and you will be successful the the oil that runs that machine is freaking hard work be up at five in the morning don't go to bed till midnight when you're young you can do that unfortunately i'm still doing that so um it's opportunity success hard work creativity bring it to whatever you're doing take cases that are just you're not really interested in but take some time with that case there's these little threads that are coming out and if you pull them there may be a magic thing back there or there'll be nothing but use your ears man use your brain there's today I see golden opportunities all the way around I I found I had another opportunity the next decade I ended up suing Detroit and stopped them from steal, um, obtaining I didn't, obtaining millions of dollars in wrongful collection fees and taxes, which they shouldn't do. But my case went up to court of appeals and they confirmed, yeah, they shouldn't be doing that. And then they went ahead and changed the law. But that was another case that kind of put me on the map. Uh, and when you put on the map, I'm going to tell you what that means. I preach in a lot of my videos, you're always working on the next thing. You're, if you're in front of a judge and you're trying to say, hey, you got to rule my way on this motion, Your Honor, you're constantly selling the case because you're thinking about the next time you're in front of that judge. 
he or she may go, oh yeah, that's the case where uh, Parker said blah 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 blah, and they'll sometimes write if you say it. He'll that message that you give to the judge will travel through every motion and trial for that case. So you're always selling yourself for the next case event, and most importantly, that that's what you do with a big type case. You get a reputation. And if someone connects the dots, uh, in my current iteration of whatever I began and now where I am, everybody knows who I am and what I do. And expert, 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 sell, I settle cases like that. It's uh, Every once in a while someone will come along and give me a fight. That's all right. But my clients benefit greatly from the hard work I did before. Dummy me, I should now coast. But now I'm looking on this other thing I for my third decade I found something I want to do it's really cool I may do touch upon it in a in another video and then you can all steal the idea if you want um, but you gotta have hard work opportunity creativity um, that's success man in the law it's there treat it like a business treat it like fun and protect it and develop it and you're going to take hits, man, you're going to take hits. I had this one idea a couple of years ago. I am to this day beside myself. I know I'm right and I'm not certain about anything. Very. I know I'm right. I keep getting my ass kicked at every level. So I finally said, forget it, because it was taking away from the practice again. And you got to guard. you got to believe, but guard that practice that's what got you to be in the position you're in. So I had to give up the idea, and I'm not, I don't quit anything. I do not believe in the no-win situation. I just, what's, why do you start anything believing you can't freaking win? I, the best line I ever heard to this day, or one of them was, people talk about going for this great thing, but just in case, I'm gonna go work for my uncle. Or I've got this great idea, but just in case, because I want to write this great book, I'm going to keep working. And, not, and I know people that have these great ideas and they don't get off the stick. And they have this plan B. And I believe it's a great line. If you have a plan B, you don't have a plan A. So what I want to tell you is believe in yourself and believe in that idea. Who cares? You're going to be dead. I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be dead in my, about when I'm 80. And accept that, and you will be able to do, you'll free yourself of so many restrictions. Who gives you shit? <laughs> be your best. Be your best for your clients. Recognize opportunity. Recognize that creativity and hard work are a beautiful mix. And have fun. Don't like what you do. Love what you do. I know I'm talking on and on. So if you love what I'm doing, I'm supposed to say uh, subscribe. You can go to my uh, website, which is uh, collectionstopper.com, and I put all the show notes there. What does that mean? Every video, I put out a two-page uh, reference or guide. So if you miss something or don't want to sit through this face again, you can just read. And you can take it to court if it's on how to do a win a motion or how to do a deposition. So I think that's useful. I hope this is useful, and I thank you very much for spending time with me.